I worked together when Tim released the audio yep. version of Vagabonding. We did. And uh, I didn't even look at the timeline. Uh, the Obstacle is the Way came out after that. So we, you must have been working on that book while you were promoting um, Tim's projects. I, I was, yeah. I think you uh, yours was the first book in the audiobook club and mine was like second or third. You know, it feels like uh, your new book, uh, Stillness is the Key, is sort of an extension of uh, The Obstacle is the Way, that it's sort of the third part of a trilogy. Might you sort of think of that in those terms? Yeah, it, it wasn't an intentional trilogy in that I, I sort of, I wrote one book and then I decided to write a second book using the same sort of structure, uh, you know, loosely based on the same philosophy. And then the the third book, it, it became clear that I, I, I sort of did have a trilogy, but um, it, it wasn't as if I set out at the beginning and said, you know, this is a three book arc. It sort of in, ensued a bit more naturally, which I, I think is the 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 better way to do art, because you don't want to necessarily be like leaving stuff on the table. Like when I wrote Obstacle, I, I said everything that I thought I had to say. And then when I did Ego, I thought I said everything I had to say. And then it turns out you have more. But I, I, I don't know how intentional you can really be about a trilogy. Were you aware of the category of book that Obstacle was? I, and I asked that because I wrote... When Random House talked to me about doing Vagabonding, they thought they were going to get a How to Travel book, and I kind of gave them a Why to Travel book that, yeah. that, that sort of ended up being a How to Live Well book, and I accidentally wrote what I guess is considered sort of a big idea book You know that, that ended up being in, in a kind of synergy with the four-hour work week and other books. So did you know that The Obstacle is the Way was a four-hour well, – I'm sorry, was a um, – was a big idea book when you wrote it or was it just sort of accidentally a big idea book? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, so what I try to think about when I'm writing this book, a book is I think about who the audience is. So like, do I know there is a concrete real group of people that is large enough to support a book? Like, do I know they exist? And do I have a reasonable way to, to get at them? And, and my thinking was, look, there's already a, a, a decently large amount of people who are interested in stoicism. I remember when I when I sold the book, there was a a, a, a subreddit on reddit.com, a, a community about stoicism. There's about 10,000 people. And so I thought, OK, so there's like 10,000 people that are explicitly interested in stoicism. And then I thought there's lots of business people who are always looking at history to find out how to be better at what they do. And so let's say that quadruples or quintuples the size of the audience. So maybe there's like 100,000 people who are potentially interested in this thing. And that's who I was writing for. You know, it's interesting. Obstacle came out and it's 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 in the business category. Like, you know, you have to put the, I think they're called the bisect categories in the back. It's in business. Since uh, Obstacle came out and Ego came out, the self-help genre, that's like Mark Manson's book and and uh, James Clear's books, and a, a lot of people I'm friends with, their books are more definitively in what's now known as the self-help space. That was sort of a ghetto in publishing for a long time. And my books, so that's why my books were in business, because there was a clear group of business readers. If I was doing it all over, I might have thought about sort of a big idea self-help book, but I was really just thinking more like, who is this for, and am I delivering value for them? Was any of this audience your audience? Did you have a, yeah. a following by this time? Yeah, so I'd done a, a, a marketing book before Obstacle that had sold well and it debuted on the bestseller list. So I had a, a group of people who are interested in my writing generally. And then I'd been writing about stoicism online for you know five or six years. I'd actually written an article for Tim Ferriss's site in 2009 called like Stoicism 101. And and that had done well, too. So I, I'd written about stoicism and there were there were people who knew uh, that um, I existed. But I would say the first week sales of the book were, you know, three, four thousand copies top. So that was about my fan. Let, let's say five to ten thousand people. That was like my fan base when the book came out. Um, and, and obviously it sold more than that, but you have to launch. It's very hard to launch to nobody. Hmm. Do you have a sense for when it tipped from your personal following to a broader, more viral following? 
Well, being in the Tim Ferriss book club, that was obviously big. Um, you know, like I think the the first week I sold, let's say, 4,000 copies. The second week I sold 2,000 copies. And then the third or fourth week, that's when the book club announcement went up. And I probably sold five or 6,000 copies. So so that was my first sort of jolt of outside people. Um, but the sales really began to pick up. Uh, the book came out in May. I would say sort of by the end of that year, they were humming along independently. And that was because the, the, the Obstacle is the Way had started to make its way through professional sports. A bunch of different uh, coaches were reading and talking about it. And so that, that started to happen sort of towards the the end of 2014, the beginning of 2015. And then the big pivotal moment for the book was an article in Sports Illustrated in, I think, December of 2015 about how the book had made its way through sports. And and like the publisher immediately ran out of copies. And that 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 was when it was like, oh, this book is is sticking around. Huh. Um, it's it's interesting that you actually I don't I want to I want to properly jump ahead in a second to, yeah. to stillness is the key. But it feels like as I was reading stillness of the key, it's like the one the one group of people who are professionally present by requirement are athletes. You know, you mm -hmm. can't you can't be on the pitching mound and not be present. Um, I, I, I just wonder, it's probably too early to tell how that's going to how this new book is going to resonate with athletes. But did you think about athletes as you were writing Stillness of the Key? Has that has that audience become a part of your mindset when you're approaching your books now? Yeah, de definitely. And I, I wrote Ego is the Enemy um, with with some real input from coaches that I'd met and then this book as well. And and what you do once you start to notice who influencers are in different spaces is that obviously you communicate with them during the creative process, but but then also you you give them the book early. So yeah, I I, I just uh, I I already know that it started to resonate, um, and I've started to hear from people, and then and then we're we're gonna do a big mail out uh, as as well. But yeah, pro professional sports was not you, you're always humbled by how much you didn't even know about communities. Like I, I wasn't thinking about military communities when I was writing it. I wasn't thinking about sports um, and, and I wasn't thinking about a lot of different groups. So that's why I think you really have to think much more on the individual level, like what you, you have to deliver some universal value. Um, and then as a marketing strategy, you have to get it to the groups that you wanted to get it to. But, but fundamentally, I think people are people and so, you, you know, an athlete has to be professionally present, but everyone appreciates presence in their life, and so you 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 have to you have to go to the core of of, of whatever the human experience is in the work. It's interesting that earlier you were talking about sections of the bookstore and you know the, the self help versus the the business type sections because in a sense vagabonding was a book you know my own book was in a, a book that was in the travel section for a long time and then suddenly also because of Tim Ferriss people who normally would go to the business section of the bookstore um, were more interested they had a reason to seek out the travel section of the bookstore um, yeah and and it's so go ahead. Yeah, it, it's weird, too, because, uh, as you know, when you're going through a book with publishers, they have like I've probably talked about the bisect categories with my publisher on the, on the new book like 20 times, 25 times. And they're very convinced it matters. Uh, it what I ended up doing is I was like and, and I love bookstores. I spend lots of time in them. I, I, I try to support them as much as I can. But I, I had the publisher pull up the math on like where my sales come from. And it's like 80% Amazon, so that's Kindle, audio, and then physical and Amazon. And then it's like 15% Barnes and Noble, and then it's like 5% other stores. And so as as big of a supporter as I am of retail and as important as I think it it is in terms of exposure, I you ultimately have to realize that these categories don't matter. What matters is like do what what do the real readers think like for many many years the bookstores and the book salespeople were like the the gatekeepers to the public but now the vast majority of your sales come directly from customers who are often just typing in the title on Amazon right and mm -hmm. so um, people can get way caught up in minutia and and ultimately I think what your book is is a testament of and I, I hope mine are too which is like <laughs> 
the vast majority of people reading them don't remember where they found it. They they didn't randomly discover it. It's that somebody else told them you should read this book. And so whether that was in a business context or a personal context or a travel context or whatever it is, it, it was really like one human being was recommending it to another human being and then they just went and purchased it. And I find most successful books, movies, music is driven along those lines. It's not discovered by someone saying, I love novels about cowboys. Please tell me the uh, l- let me look at a list of novels about cowboys and then I'll pick one that seems attractive to me. Well, I think one great example for, for Obstacle is the, the fact that it was almost accidentally adopted by, for example, NFL types. Um, because I feel like there is another, an old conventional wisdom within publishing that would say, well, this sort of needs to be a how to be better at sports book, or this needs to be a how, sure. how to be a better at business book. But you approached the Obstacle as the way as kind of a big idea book, and people, and NFL people read. NFL or sports scenarios into it. Business people read business scenarios into that. Was there any pressure to, to specialize a book like Obstacle early on, or did they let you carry out your own vision? Yeah, I got I got lucky. I, I don't know about the terms on, on vagabonding, but um, my marketing book was like a marketing book that people thought would be big and controversial, and they thought, you know, so they, they had a really strong idea of what it was worth, so they, they paid a, a really good amount of money for it. When I came to them and said, hey, I want to write this book about an obscure school of ancient philosophy, they were like, um, OK. And they gave me not as much money for it. Hmm. Right. So like their expectations were quite low. And so the editing was pretty light and the marketing was pretty light. And they kind of let me do what I wanted, um, which I think was ultimately, a, you know, a, a gift. Um, Someone ironically with the title, like you'd think you'd want lots of support and a very involved publisher. And then some of they weren't involved. It's just like there wasn't a lot of pressure because like it was unlikely they would lose a lot of money on the book. Um, and that turned out to be an advantage because it gave me the freedom to write it as I saw it and and to, to put it in the terms that I wanted. Um, and I think what I did and I think really great books do is they are accessible to all different types of readers. So like I hear from people who are um, like, I heard that the president of Argentina has a copy of, of Ego is the enemy on, on his desk. I've seen like photos uh, and articles about it. So obviously he's a pretty smart guy. Uh, and, and you know, I've heard from university professors and, and, and smart, like successful people who've liked it. But I've also heard from people who are like, I haven't read a book since high school. Um, and this is the first book I've read since high school. So I think what what you really want to do is make a book that works on multiple levels. So you can't I, I so many of the philosoph the, the philosophy books that I've read, particularly the books about stoicism, assumed all sorts of knowledge and interest on behalf of the reader that really wasn't there. And what I very explicitly decided to uh, do in the book is I said, look, I'm a nerd about philosophy. I love philosophy, but most people do not wake up and think I need more philosophy in my life. They do wake up and say, I have a problem and I need a solution. And and so I, I was trying to, my intention with the structure and the style and the words that I used was to was to be very, very practical and, and to not, um, to, to not assume that the reader knew very much about the topic, but to talk to them in, in, in such a way that also wouldn't alienate people who did know about the topic. I'm curious to know how you knew that being accessible was the key here, because I think there's an instinct, and it's not a bad one necessarily, that when you become expert on something, you sort of become academically expert, that you, yeah. you, you, go, you go deep instead of broad, and then you become you know, Professor Holiday, and then suddenly you're writing in a way that sort of requires types of abstraction. Now, I know that one advantage is that you were successful when you were quite young, um, and that you weren't necessarily admired in an academic track, but how did you end up being someone who is was writing for a common audience that accidentally included NFL players and coaches, as opposed yeah. to somebody who's, you know, going for tenure and writing a monograph? Yeah, I mean, I, I've 
I don't know if the other track was ever really an option, right? Like, it's not like uh, the academia op- uh, welcomed me with open arms, and it's not like I was remotely qualified uh, to write that way. I think what happened is, so I was introduced to Stoicism when I was young, and I just fell in love with it. I was just like, I can't believe people write this way, and they say these things, and and this is like all the guidance I was all I was looking for my whole life. And then so I would read the books about stoicism, you know, like a, either an academic book or even what was attempting to be a, you know, a popular introduction. And I would I found that they were just often just they'd be like, you know, what Seneca says is this. And then they would, you know, they'd, they'd or they'd spend a lot of time really analyzing a passage or the history of, of the philosophy. And I thought, you know, this what's so wonderful about the Stoics is they just say what they mean, like like. You didn't need an academic background to understand what they were saying. So I, w- when I read them, I was like, the originals are amazing. And then all the books about them are lackluster because they're just repeating what the Stoics said in a less interesting way because there's now this sort of uh, analytical context. So what I, when I decided I would write about Stoicism, what I decided to do was take Stoic principles and illustrate them with stories um, from history and literature. Um, And and so like a a much more impressive use of this same strategy would would be something like George Lucas discovers the hero's journey through Joseph Campbell. He doesn't write an academic work on the hero's journey. He doesn't write a complicated, you know, work of of history. He writes uh, an allegory set in space that illustrates the hero's journey. And so I think what I was, that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to take these philosophical principles or these abstractions and then make them real and do it in the form of story because that's how most people learn. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want uh, by the way, how old were you when you discovered cynicism or stoicism? You said you were young. Yeah, I think I was 18 or 19. I was in college. Okay. Yeah, and I I wonder if possibly this is a way of avoiding the sort of fashions and trends that flow through academia. Like you use uh, Ulysses Grant as an example um, in Obstacle and in Stillness. But I'm sure that there's a certain kind of intellectual or academic fashion that would say, oh, well, Grant was a drunk, you know, and he had, he's a quote air quotes problematic person. I wonder. Yeah. If, I wonder if it's if it's just easier in the non academic world to focus on the practicality of all these philosophies rather than you know some sort of big picture notion yeah. of, of how appropriate a given philosopher is. Well, and and look for for the vast majority of history that people learned history with the in 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 the moral sense like history with morals. I don't mean like uh, morals, like good or bad necessarily, but I mean like lessons, right? Like e- even things like George Washington chopping down the cherry tree. It's like, I think people knew that wasn't true, but they were using the story to teach a lesson. That That's how history was taught up until pretty recently, right? Now, now obviously we have more information and we, we, we lionize sort of facts and accuracy. And I think that's well and good. But the problem is, I think people end up sort of lacking for spiritual and moral guidance. And so what I tried to do was like tell stories that were both inspiring and illustrative. And, and I was willing to do it to touch people that were a little bit radioactive or a little bit controversial. You know, I have John D. Rockefeller and I have I have Ulysses S. Grant. I even have Erwin Rommel, who was a you know fought fought for the Germans in the Second World War. Um, one of the things that that's unique in my background is I was a research assistant for a writer named Robert Greene for many years, who wrote um, a, a few of the you know sort of biggest business books of all time, The Forty Eight Laws of Power and The Art of Seduction and the, the Strategies of War. And I learned that idea of telling interesting stories, even potentially controversial, controversial or polarizing stories, was ultimately the way that readers uh, resonate with books. And I think it's important for people, if you're sitting down and thinking about writing a book, look, there's there's people who read the books that are reviewed in The New York Times and this is probably 10% of the reading public, and then there's everybody else, right? Um, 
And you've got to, you, in some ways, you kind of got to decide who you're writing for. Are you writing for the sort of critical literary uh, world in which it's very elite? There's a lot of gatekeepers. If you're accepted by this world, it, it can be hugely beneficial to your career. But if you're not, um, you will find that the audience is quite small. I was just talking to a friend about this. I don't know if you noticed it, but you probably appreciate it. Um, Malcolm Gladwell appears in the nonfiction section of the New York Times bestseller list. If anyone else wrote the exact same book that wasn't a journalist for The New Yorker, they would absolutely appear on the advice how to miscellaneous list, which is like where I appear. And so ultimately, I decided, look, I'm not going to battle for the approval of these people. I'm going to write for people, as I was saying, who don't read a lot of books necessarily or don't sort of so so I, I don't care if they don't like Ulysses S. Grant. I know that ordinary people find him to be generally inspiring. And so that these are decisions you want to make in the creative process. In a way, I think you sort of have to be true to your own vision. And I know that that's almost saying that is almost a cliche. Um, but you, you talked about how there's the advice how to miscellaneous, you know, bestseller department. Yeah. Well, when I wrote Vagabonding, Random House thought they were getting a how to travel book. Right. Yeah. And they just they just didn't understand it at all. They they I mean, I kept getting this feedback like, well, don't you have some tips on how to roll your socks? And, and something like, like they just didn't they didn't understand that. it that it, And I, maybe I didn't understand either that it was a big idea book for like for me, John Muir and Walt Whitman and Annie Dillard were as important to my motivation to travel as any tips for rolling your socks. <laughs> yeah. Look, and I, I, I think that's absolutely the right decision for an important reason. The, the three, I, I've never read Annie Diller, but the two other people that you mentioned, their books have been in print for literally hundreds of years, right? And their books, even though they were written a really long time ago, they resonate deeply with us as if they were published today, right? Meanwhile, uh, whatever the most popular travel book of 1970 was and 1982 and 1991, I don't know what those are and chances are they're not still in print. And so I th it's not just big idea. I think that can be misleading because there's a lot of big ideas people have, you know, about the news media right now or big ideas about where we are politically. Like there's all these sort of Trump books that are coming out right now that you might classify as big idea, but you would also classify them as being sort of like breaking news or contemporary politics. Um, but what I think what I think you ideally want to do is go deeper and go more timeless. Jeff Bezos has this line. He says, you know, focus on the on the things that don't change. That idea of wanderlust and the idea of seeing the world and the idea of vagabonding, you went to the most timeless version of the idea. All Almost all of the travel tips that you could have put in that book, which was, what, 15 years ago now that it came out? Yeah. Um, a, a, a lot of those travel tips have been made, have been rendered irrelevant. But, you know, it used to be you didn't have to go through this kind of security. Now you do. You used to have to take your shoes off. Now some people do. Some people don't. You know, like the, the specifics uh, are often uh, rendered irrelevant by the passage of time. And so, look, I, I think I cheated with the obstacles away and ego's enemy and stillness is the key by basing the book on a 2000 year old philosophy chances are that 2000 philosophy, year old philosophy is not going to be suddenly anachronistic like tomorrow. It might fade slowly from from people's interest, but um, it's not, you know, fidget spinners or some other fad. Well, that's something that occurred to me as I was reading Stillness is the Key is that Another way of writing this book is uh, th this is why smartphones are bad book or how to better yeah. navigate whatever technology is happening right now. And so just because of my own mindset, I was applying a lot of what you wrote in Stillness of the key, is the Key to, you know, my smartphone apps, right? But who yeah. knows how different that will be in a few years? Were you aware? Did you have technology on the brain as you were doing Stillness is the Key? Or were you were you firmly rooted in, in 2000 years of philosophy? Well, I'm always thinking about right now, and I'm sort of alluding to those because I want it to feel rooted in the present. But I also don't want it to be too rooted in the present that it can be made irrelevant. So um, most of the examples that I choose are from history. And, and I always want to make sure that the, the underlying point I'm making 
has more or less always been true and always will be true. So, you know, there's a quote from Blaise Pascal where he says, like, all of man's uh, problems stem from the inability to sit quietly in a room alone. You know, he said that 500 years ago. And so it, it gave me a good sense that um, I'm, I'm, I'm rooted in, in something uh, deep. But, like, I also open, you know, part two of the book with a story of Tiger Woods. And in between when I finished the uh, manuscript and the galleys were printed and then the final edition, Tiger Woods won another uh, major tournament. So I had to like significantly change a section of the book. So the, there, one, of the, one of the downsides to being too current is that you never know how things are going to shake out. And in Perennial Cellar, for instance, uh, which is about timelessness, ironically, I talk a lot about Louis C.K., whose career I've long admired. And then what do you know? You know, he's sort of, uh, you know, um, his career disintegrates because, you know, of me too. And so the, the, the more you can look backwards, the, the better your chances of, of not stepping on something like that. As far as allocating your energy then, how, how, off, how much do you research ancient work versus classic work versus common day events? I mean, you only have so much time. You have a family. Yeah. Um, you have, you, and you, you're a very prolific guy. You come out with about a book a year. Do you have any instincts for where you want to focus? Keeping in mind that actually sometimes Tiger Woods is a great example, but there's yeah. some disadvantages to that. How do, you, how do you allocate your time that way? So I, I'm, I'm always reading and I try to read uh, as diversely as possible. So not but I think when people hear diversity, they often think just like sort of race or gender. Obviously, that's really important. But I want to be reading Eastern philosophy and Western philosophy. And I want to be reading about the Middle Ages. And I want to be reading about ancient Rome. And I want to be reading about Lyndon Johnson. Right. Like I want to be reading all these different things and then always be looking for connections between those things. Um, but generally where I think if you're, if your question is sort of, how do you decide what not to focus on? Hmm. One of the things I try not to focus on is like not consuming a lot of news in real time. Like if, if you want to be informed about what's happening between the U S and China right now, I, I don't think you read, uh, you know, the, you don't watch the latest breaking CNN report and you don't follow Donald Trump's tweets. I would urge you to go read, you know, Thucydides, uh, the history of the Peloponnesian War, which is about, uh, you know, a, a long war between an ascendant power and a dominant power. And indeed, that's what really smart people in the State Department are reading now. And so uh, most of most of history is just the same thing happening over and over again in a slightly different way. And travel is, a, you know, travel's a, um, an interesting way to do this, too. I was in uh, Istanbul and the the main sort of Roman uh, chariot racing track there, I'd vaguely remembered reading about it. And so, you know, I pull up the Wikipedia page and I'm I always like you're like, wait, like 2000 years ago or 1500 years ago, like there was a riot over a chariot match uh, in which 10 percent of the population of Istanbul died. Uh, it turned political. The emperor almost had to ab abdicate, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, oh, okay, look, uh, political strife is timeless. Uh, it's always bad. Uh, and maybe I can uh, calm down a little bit. I don't need to get so worked up. And I think travel and history and reading is a way to, to learn that. It is. And I don't want to go too far off on a tangent about travel. I mean, it's just, it's something that's always on my mind, but um it's one of those things where, like, often I get the sense as the, the the new Gulf War started in 2003 that George Bush wasn't really sure about the difference between Shia and Sunni Muslims, you know. Um, yeah. And that, that's something that, that one week in a country that contains both, like one week in Lebanon, for example, can clear that up in a very charming way. Uh, sure. And, and similarly with, with totally. China, I mean, you also get a sense for the Han Chinese versus people who aren't Chinese, Han Chinese and how that affects the way people think in that part of the world. So, uh, yeah, so I guess you're sort of preaching to the choir in terms of, uh, of how travel can so. deepen that. Um, I'm curious, you use the word commonplace book. I almost accidentally came into the 
to the place where I use a commonplace book. And in fact, I have been using an iteration of a commonplace book without even knowing that's what it is since 1995. Since my audience might not know what a commonplace book is, why don't you define a commonplace book and then talk about how you started using it and how it serves you as a writer? So yeah, talking about history and and probably something I discovered while traveling, you know, what, what, what people used to do and and by people i mean like for thousands of years uh and and a lot of these editions survive to us is you would you would have a journal or a diary or a book and in this book you would record quotes stories events uh, observations you had in the course of your reading in your daily life so um when you couldn't just keep photos of stuff in your phone, or you couldn't just have a folder in Evernote of all the things that you liked, people had to be much more precious about this information. And so, um, you know, we have commonplace books from Montaigne and and from Jefferson and from, you know, uh, Cicero and all, and we have the collections of just sort of them synthesizing the knowledge and experiences that they had in their life. And so when I was a research assistant, I learned a version of of what a commonplace book was, but not in a book. Uh, Robert Greene taught me how to do it on note cards. And so I, every time I read a book, when I finish the book, I give it a little time to settle. And then I break that book down on four by six note cards. And I transfer the knowledge that I got there into a sort of a, a, a container of that information. And so each one of my books... Um, and most of the articles that I've written um, have come from this accumulation of insights or connections or ideas. The Obstacle is the Way started as a note card. I was reading a book about Stoic philosophy written by a French philosopher named Pierre Hadot, and he talks about this passage in Marcus Aurelius that that became that 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 is the passage that I open um, the Obstacle is the Way with, and and. So it's about don't just read books, don't just highlight things in Kindle, don't don't just send them into the black hole of Evernote. Like you've really got to interact with the material and and record it. Well, I want to I want to touch on the utility of note cards versus the Evernote slash Scrivener type approach, um, just because I think you've you you're a big believer in actual physical note cards. But before we get there, I just want to point out again for our audience, I actually taught a big idea book course in Paris this summer, and a, my students were were excellent. They they were very they knew their area of expertise very well. What they had less um, flexibility with was examples supporting their expertise. Um, totally. so, so basically they knew the, the basic iterations of how a finance corporation works, but what they didn't have is an illustration from Thucydides or Walt Whitman or Anne Frank or whoever, who would help illustrate how this, these certain corporate and human behaviors work. And so it feels like, again, for people who are listening with an idea of maybe capturing their ideas, I don't know if there's a better version of a commonplace book. In, in a sense, the internet is a commonplace book. You know, Wikipedia yeah. is a commonplace book. Um, so is Tumblr. Yeah, but but in a way, it's almost like cheating for a test versus studying for a test. Um, and I had study partners in college who, um, if a professor gave us one note card to write down the answers on, they would concentrate on getting on the information on the card rather than understanding the information on the card. And, and um, right. they didn't test as well. well look- yeah, of course. And look, it doesn't just have to be for people who are writing books. I, I gave a, a talk at the Reagan Library in California. I think it was this year, but it might have been the end of last year. But anyways, um, and I said, look, they, 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 they had me interview someone on stage. And I said, look, I will do this on one condition. I want you to let me look through the presidential archives, because what I knew was that uh, Ronald Reagan is not like my favorite president or anything. I, um, but but Ronald Reagan was an avid keeper of a commonplace book. And in fact, he did them on three by five note cards that he kept in a photo binder. And I wanted to go cards. And, and actually what made Reagan such an amazing speaker, um, both before he was president, because he was he, he was uh, uh, in, he was like the head of public relations for a bunch of different big uh, lobbying groups, 
and then as governor and then as president was his speechwriters would go, OK, you're giving a speech in you know Berlin today about uh, communism or you're giving a speech in Ohio to factory workers. Here's what you know, here's our draft. And he would look at the speech and he'd cross out big sections and be like, this is boring. This is terrible. He's like, bring me my binder. And they would bring him his binder and he'd open it and he'd have the perfect sort of old yarn or joke or story um, or or fact or quote from history that he could plug in these speeches. And so what he was such an effective communicator because all his life he had accumulated basically ammunition that he could then call on in the perfect scenario. And and Douglas Brinkley, the historian, actually published a book uh, called like the note cards or something that is Reagan's like sort of most interesting quotes from this book. But again, this doesn't just have to be writers. This is public speakers. This is uh, business executives. This is parents. You, you're going to need things to buttress your arguments. But in the mo- you, it, it's not possible to go, I need a really good story about hard work. You can't just Google for that. You, it has to be, it, you have to, it, it's found often in a totally unrelated setting and you, you, you almost, it almost appreciates like wine in your cellar or something. That makes me respect Reagan because, um, the commonplace book, it's, it's, it's a conscious and deliberate decision to to keep intellectual practice, to sort of yes. to gather your eggs through everything you read. And and like you said, Jefferson, Da Vinci, even Hamlet, who's a fictional character, had commonplace books. And it's this idea that whatever effort you put into reading a book, you're, you want to, and I've, always, I've thought this way again since the mid-90s when I started this, you're sort of harvesting the ideas that resonate with you. And totally. f- for me specifically, I just started typing in 1995, typing what I enjoyed from these books, you know, Walt Whitman, Annie Dillard, people I've mentioned already, into word files, and they slowly became the building blocks of vagabonding. And then later, I discovered Scrivener, which I had on my computer for two years before I started using it. And since then, I'm I'm just a diehard Scrivener guy. It somehow really jives with my organizational system. But if I'm not mistaken, you're still a paper note cards guy. What's the what's the argument for for doing your commonplace book on paper? So it's it's the process of of I think with if you're just copying and pasting, um, you are skipping the part where it flows through you in some way or another. Um, it's like uh, I have a, a handful of phone numbers memorized because I used to have to dial them in the phone. Um, meanwhile, like. Uh, basically anyone I've met since 2005, I don't have, uh, I don't know their phone number, right? And if I ever needed them, I'd be in big trouble. So for me, it's the process of sitting down and writing. So sometimes I'll type up large passages just to speed them up, but it's it's really the process of it's in the book and then I want it on a note card or I want it in storage somewhere. I can't skip the step where it goes through me. Um, and so uh, the reason I have pretty good recall of quotes is not because I have a photographic memory. It's that I've engaged with the material now in a handful of settings. And and so I, I just think that's a really important part. I mean, I'm not insane about it. I, I have um, I have all this, the, the cards scanned, but it's also just the act. I mean, you'll probably appreciate this as a traveler. Um, like I, I'm on the road a lot. Right. Um, um, I travel for fun, but I also, you know, do a lot of speaking. And if I don't want to stop writing, I'm not going to bring thousands of note cards with me. So I, I, I just bring whatever the stack of the section that I'm working on just then is. So it's pretty mobile, also. Um, but, but I, I want to engage with the material. That's really at the core of it. How do you know how to find a given card? Just because I'm thinking sometimes yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll pull up something that I wrote down in 2002, but that's because it's categorized under a certain Scrivener folder or, or Word folder. How do you yeah. keep organized? So so in the commonplace book itself, it's roughly organized by theme. I have a handful of themes, like mostly the ones that I tend to write about or I tend to read about a lot. Um, and then when I'm writing a book, um, you know, it's like, okay, I think this generally goes, like I, I'm researching a book now. So I generally know like the theme of the book, 
So it's like, okay, I'm going to write this down. I'll just put the title of the book there. Um, and then once I've accumulated, you know, a couple hundred cards, let's say, then I start to break it down into smaller sections. So there's a process in the research phase. It's a pretty big milestone when you go from the just generally researching about vagabonding, let's say in your case, to writing about, you know, what, what you want, the argument you're making in chapter two of vagabonding. And in terms of like percentage wise, how much of your, your evidence chapters come out of your commonplace book versus new research, just to spitball a percentage? Yeah, I, I would say like, let's say I'm starting this new book, I'll go back through and I might find, you know, 100 or 200 cards that will become sort of the core of a book. But ultimately, I'm now going to go off and fill this with new material. And, and you know, one of the tough things for me, because I wrote Obstacle Ego, and then I wrote this book called The Daily Stoic, which is like a page a day of Stoic philosophy. In like three years, I burned through like all my I burned through like 10 years of material. And so for stillness, one of the things I really had to do, although there's some characters that repeat, is I had to sort of go like, I have to get like basically all new people. Um, and and so that involved a lot of reading and a lot of, you know, going down blind alleys. Uh, but but it it was the decision to go like, hey, my my cupboard's getting a little bare and I've got to go, you know, I've got to go back to the grocery store. It was interesting to see which non-Stoics had multiple appearances in, in Stillness is the Key. I mean, Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, shows up to illustrate several points. Um, Dorothy Day, who I didn't know about, a, apparently a, a Catholic nun, comes up uh, several times, and as does Anne Frank, but also an MLK, but then also Johnny Cash, who you usually don't think of in a philosophical sense. Yeah. So was this positive, was this brand new research, or were th do, yeah. you, do you have Johnny Cash in your commonplace book? So, I mean, I, I'm a Johnny Cash fan, but what happened, I, I know how that process, I know that one very specifically. I was reading Stephen Pressfield's book, The Artist Journey, and he talks about uh, Roseanne Cash's memoir. Um, and so I read Roseanne Cash's memoir, and I thought it was really interesting. I got a bunch of stuff. That's where I got the story and Stillness is the Key about uh, relationships, where Johnny Cash is. And I thought, oh, I, I didn't, you know, I just thought of mostly as Johnny Cash as a musician, and I'd seen a movie about him. And so I got really into listening to Johnny Cash. And then I read a biography about Johnny Cash. And then I read uh, his memoir. And so you, you just kind of, you just twist and turn down these things. The Mr. Rogers one is funny. When I wrote in the proposal uh, about Mr. Rogers, I was really excited. I was like, nobody knows about this this guy. They just think about him as this, you know, host from a children's television show. I was so excited. Excited, and then in between the time the proposal and the book came out, it's like Tom Hanks is starring in a movie about him, and then there's been like multiple biographies, and he's had this whole resurgence. But these were all just kind of chance encounters uh, with different things. Dorothy Day, I read, you know, someone mentioned her in a book, and they mentioned her in a way that it seemed like everyone was supposed to know who Dorothy Day was. So I I read a book um, that was a biography of Dorothy Day and one other person, and so comes from just the decision to go or, or the even the admission like i've never heard of that person i don't know anything about them i'm gonna fix that and then you just you just keep going it's interesting you you mentioned stephen pressman's book which is sort of you know a big idea type book do you read many big idea but type books or do you find yourself more rooted in, in in ancient or classic books or biographies or things like that how do you mix up your reading yeah, I, I tend not to read a lot of new books, um, except if they're written by a person that I really respect or admire. So like anytime Stephen Pressfield publishes something, I read it. You know, Mark Manson's a friend, so I read his stuff. Um, I just um, I was just going to mention, oh, like I really liked uh, one of the best big idea books I've read this year. I read David Epstein's book Range, hmm. um, which I think is like just fantastic. Um, but it's funny, like I was, I was talking to him, I read the book and I, uh, you know, I was like, you know, here, here's an interesting story about, you know, I was like, uh, his, his, the book is basically pitting sort of specialists versus generalists. And his ultimate argument is that range is, is more powerful. And, uh, and I was like, you know, they seem like the sort of, you know, the Spartans were specialists and the Athenians were generalists. And, and he was like, oh my God, I wish you, 
had I wish we'd talked when the book was coming out because that's like a perfect analogy to draw. And that that that's really what um, I think the process is, is like you're out reading and experiencing things. And then that is bouncing off this database of examples and anecdotes and facts and stories that you have. And, and the books come from the connections between those those two things. Is there ever a point at which research becomes too much where it becomes a form of procrastination or does does everything exist under the water of the tip of the iceberg? Oh, uh, definitely. So I like to make a big distinction between like the writing phase and the research phase. So obviously there is some research you have to do like um, during a book because you go, oh, I don't know this fact or, you know, I'm, I'm actually missing a story or, you know, I'm going to go in a different direction than I intended. But like I try to I try to like with stillness, I sold it in December of 2016. Um, and, and so it's coming out in, in the I guess the fall of 2019. So let's say I started researching in January. Obviously I had some research, but like, let's say that the clock starts January, 2017. I, I, um, I believe I started writing in, am I getting this right? I might have, I did, but I know I start, I, I researched for about a year and then I started writing, like I ended the research phase on June 16, uh, 2018, because that was like my birthday. And I was like, you got to draw the line somewhere. So I make, I, I do, I, it's not a ceremony, but I do go like, and the, the research ends and the writing starts, um, because it can become an endless form of procrastination. Are you ever anxious that maybe you, you don't have enough? I mean, there, I mean, you have a lot of great stories from athletes. You have stories from from authors and historical figures. Do you are, do you ever wake up in the middle of the night, halfway through the book, and think, "Oh, I need to include more, you know, philosophers or religious figures"? Or do do you have anxieties in that regard? I mean, I, I'm I'm conscious of like you want to make sure that this these aren't all dead white guys, you know, like you want to make sure that the book feels inclusive and that it's diverse. Again, not just for uh, gender and race reasons, but that that you're capturing a variety of viewpoints. Um, so I, I, that gives me some anxiety. I'm much more, I'm much less concerned. Like I don't have enough material, and I'm I'm typically more anxious about like whether my argument is is going to land. Like it's it's more like is this something people actually need? Does anyone care? Not like can I marshal enough support to to um, say what I want to say. So I, because I, I, the research stuff to me is, is almost like second nature and I like it so much. I guess the worry is more like, um, yeah, is this, is this book going to be any good? That, that's what keeps me up at night when I'm writing. And that's why um, you should feel blessed not to be an academic, right? Because yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, that's such a useful model from which to write a book, right? But the academic world has these different hoops to jump through. Um, that often aren't as useful. And I would think that sometimes there's types of, of, of research, like do you do much Google or Wikipedia research uh, or is it mostly books? Yeah, I, I mean, you, you, you have to be careful, obviously relying on Wikipedia, but, but uh, yeah, you do wanna go get facts here and there and you gotta check stuff out. And um, I, I like to use like um, obituaries, like let's say I'm writing about a modern person and they've they've died, like New York Times obituaries, Washington Post obituaries often have lots of really interesting stuff. And then you can be really confident, like the dates and places and, and names are all correct because they've been properly fact checked. Um, so I, I like to do stuff like that. I've watched documentaries from time to time, like in this book, um, there, there wasn't really a great book about Marina Abramovich. Um, but there was some really great New York Times reporting about her artist is present exhibit. And there's also a documentary about the same name uh, with the same name. So so I, I'm willing to get, you know, stuff uh, from from anywhere provided, you know, I believe it's it's verified or you know accurate. But you 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 can't be choosy about where your stuff comes from. And in fact, if you're if you're only drawing from, you know, like the best selling books of the last couple of years, you I, it, just as an aside, an example, I find when I read a lot of big idea business books, it's like 
it feels like they're all relying on like the same 15 academic studies. You know, it's like it's the willpower experiment and the paradox of choice experiment and the Stanford prison experiment. And, you know, it's like it, they think it's new because it's new to them. But if they'd read a little bit more widely in their own space, they'd realize that um, they'd be better off going a bit deeper or 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 treading on some newer ground. I'm curious, once you get your material, once you have, you, once you've pulled in this material from all these different places, from, from Stoics to Tiger Woods to Johnny Cash, how the structure works? Because I, I've noticed that like on your latest book, the chapters, uh, well, there's three sections and they're all about seven or eight pages long. There's about 10 or 11 chapters per section, which is not that different from how Obstacle was organized. And so, is there an intentionality to how you divide these books and how do you create a roadmap for these books? So I always decide the structure before I start writing um, or before I, you know, go very far in the writing. So I, I want to break like obstacle, you know, I was sort of fooling around. I was deciding how I wanted the book to be. I'd done the research. That book, I didn't start until I said, oh, okay, I'm going to split this up uh, along perception, action, will as the three sections. Um, early on in stillness, I decided to do to sort of mind, body, soul, um, with ego as the enemy. Uh, I, I also needed a three-part structure. And so I, I thought, you know, look, it sort of, you're, you're in one of three phases in life. You're sort of setting out to do something, you're successful, or you're, you know, you're going through adversity. Ego is different in all three phases. So first I crack the three-part structure. If it is a three-part structure, I've done books that have different parts, but you you the, you pick the three-part structure and then you decide, you know, sort of loosely how I, I go, okay, you know, I write the first part and it's about 10 and then symmetry is important to me. Um, and so I go, okay, let's do 10, 10 and 10. And then I you just sort of go from there and you, you kind of pick a length uh, that you're going for as well. Um, you know, the, the obstacle was about 50,000 words. Ego is about 55. Stillness is like 62. Um, so the fact that they were in what loosely became a trilogy did um, help me make some structural decisions. And as you're dividing into individual chapters, how much, and this is going to sound weird, but how objective versus subjective are you? Because stillness has individual chapters on things like journaling and walking, which feel pretty personal. They feel like habits that you cultivate yeah. as an individual. Um, so how does that, how do your own sensibilities overlap with a more objective sense for what you're trying to get across? Well, you're, you're trying, I, I am always trying to write with myself a little bit as the audience. So when I'm writing Ego is the Enemy, I'm not saying I don't have an ego, listen to me. I'm saying, look, this is how you need to keep your ego in check. So some of these are things that I'm good at. Some of these things that I'm, there are things that I'm aspiring to do. But what, what I think was empowering for me as a writer was the realization that like you have a big idea, but that doesn't mean you have to constantly be talking about that big idea. Uh, a big idea is really a collection of smaller overlapping intersecting ideas. And so I really write these books, let's say Obstacle is 32 chapters, 10 in each part and an intro and a conclusion. Um, I'm sitting down and I'm I'm writing 32 different sort of contained scenes or arguments or whatever you want to call it. Um, and I know that they're, they're corralling the reader towards the ultimate conclusion that I want them to do, but I'm not repeating myself over and over again about obstacles being the way i'm just sort of revealing that truth from different angles so yeah so journaling is related to stillness and it makes room for stillness and it 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 facilitates stillness um but i'm not just saying stillness is the key over and over again across 32 chapters i'm giving you 32 ways to get there or whatever are you thinking in terms of arc for each of these 30 or 32 chapters um, are you thinking about where each you know, mini section of the book begins and ends, or is it more along a book length arc? I guess it's the book length arc, but I, but I am thinking each one as a self-contained thing. I, that was something I got from Tim Ferriss. He was like, sort of think about them as magazine articles. Can they, can they stand on their own? Um, and when they can, I think, 
you know, the, the book just becomes stronger because it allows one of the things I've heard from people on the books, it's been, you know, humbling and really cool. And, and it's certainly true for my favorite books is that people reread them or they just pick up different sections and they go, I read a section a night or, you know, I was really going through X, Y, or Z. And so I picked up and I reread this section of the book. Um, that only works if the, if the book is a series of self-contained, uh, chapters. I noticed that some parts of of stillness have sort of itemized lists or bullet points, but not every chapter. I mean, on, on page 21, you, you itemize what is needed in times of stress. Um, on, on page 183, you itemize what traits are needed to, to cultivate to achieve stillness. How, what kind of strategy goes into when you want to break points into bullet points, as opposed to doing so, it for every chapter? Yeah, so I think I have bullet points in that book in and this sometimes surprises people that you don't remember everything in the book but that's because it is a series of self-contained things i think so there's a there's a longer chapter for part one part two and part three where i explain this sort of mini argument that's going to be inside this larger section and i think i have bullet points for part one part two part three which loosely correspond with what the chapters in that section are going to be so i'm saying hey, these are what we'll need to cultivate in this section. And is there, is there any classic, are there any classic ideas that drive the structure? Are there like hero's journey type ideas? I mean, big idea books usually have, they're like screenplays in that the second act is where everything happens. It's the hard part. Um, yeah. And, and so is it, are you sort of using other big idea books and other books you like, or is there an, an outside template that you're, you're sort of superimposing onto these books as you approach them? Well, in this trilogy, I definitely use the three part structure quite deliberately. And I, I got the idea from, from Sean Coyne, who's Stephen Pressfield's editor. We were just, he was like, look, I just really like three part structures. He's like, it goes back to Aristotle, you know, uh, this is how we tend to split things up. Uh, three is a nice sort of, uh, uh, manageable number. Um, and, 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 you know, sort of beginning, middle, end, uh, in this case, mind, body, soul. Um, so, I'm not I'm not thinking so much on the hero's journey, although I have mapped uh, my book Conspiracy. I, I did do an outline where I looked at the arc from the hero's journey and I, I tried to apply it a little bit. But um, mostly I'm just thinking, like, what is the argument that I'm making and what is the most effective order for that argument to come in um, and what will be the the easiest way for the reader to retain the information? Does your table of contents change much from beginning to ending of the writing process? I don't write a table of contents uh, until the end usually, but I, I have all the sections. I have a working table of contents that is my note cards. Definitely the titles change quite a bit and the order of them changes probably more than anything. It's I, I write them all in separate documents and then they come together towards the end and that's when I you know, as you you end up rereading your book dozens of times towards the end, and you really you get the argu you get the sense like, oh, chapter two is better as chapter six, and chapter you know uh, fourteen and fifteen would be better if they flipped. And oh, because you put them in this order, you know now you have to change this title or you have to delete this reference because you know what was preceding it now uh, succeeds it, and so on and so forth. But um, to me, the table of contents is a map that you were you you ex is a key that comes to the map later, but that the the real route that you're taking the reader on is sort of built into the, like the core of what you're expressing. Once you're in writing phase, do your days sort of become habitual? Is there a is there a, a routine that's involved uh, when you when you oh, do yeah. write chapters? Yeah, so, definitely. Um, I get up early. I go for a walk in the morning. Uh, I have breakfast with my family and then I write. Um, and I, I, I usually write from, you know, let's say eight, eight thirty to like, you know, 11, 12. And that's, that's the day. And it's just the days just flow one into the other. And you're, you're, you're existing in the world and you are participating, but you are also not of the world. And a part of your brain is, 
you know, completely preoccupied. And so it's, uh, you know, being researching a book, you can participate and be a normal human being. I find it's very difficult to 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 be 100 percent yourself while a book is, uh, you know, partially written. Huh. So you didn't mention afternoon. You keep your afternoons free or is it writing just a morning thing? Uh, afternoons are for just other work related stuff. Like, so whether that's working with clients of my company or whether that's marketing stuff for the book, or, you know, if it was a podcast I had to record, or if it's going to the bank, um, I do leave a chunk in the afternoon for exercise, um, which I find tends to solve a lot of the writing problems. The, the point is you just, you hit diminishing returns as a writer and you have to get up and walk away. Um, and allow the brain to reset and allow the mind to to sort of uh, get a little bit more flexible again. And that's where you notice, uh, you know, the connections coming back or insights popping up. Is this a hard one process? Was it ever difficult to separate the the sort of company side of your brain from the writer part of your brain? Well, I, when I, I wrote Obstacle is the Way and Ego is the Enemy while I had a day job. So and actually my first book, too. So. Um, it, it, it was hard, uh, and the process has certainly morphed over the years, but, um, uh, the writing brain is where my brain naturally wants to go. So, uh, it's, it's not, it's not that difficult for me. When, when you're at your best, what does a, what does a good work day look like? Or, do, or are you, are you schedule driven enough that usually there's no good days and bad days? I mean, there's definitely better days and worse days, but uh, there, I think Pressfield talks about this a lot. Like the key is let you show up every day. So um, you're just you, a, a book is you know measured in weeks at the smallest, much more probably in months. Um, but yeah, there are days when it comes easily, and then there's days when it doesn't. Um, a days where a day where it comes easily, I might only write for an hour, you know, an hour and a half because. I did what I set out to do for that day. And, and so the process of having wins, you know, like to go like, oh, this is what I, this is what I set out to do today and I did it. So I'm not going to, I'm not just going to keep going. I'm going to walk away and come back, you know, with confidence tomorrow. Is revision a different process or does it plug into your generative writing habits? I'm, I, I do. I like the idea of don't edit while you write for the most part. Um, momentum is, is essential. And so if, if you don't get past chapter one, you can't write chapter two, you know, so you have to, you have to get comfortable with sort of crappy, crappy first drafts and progress. Uh, like progress is the, it, it's all about progress. So, um, I do the revisions. I try to do the revisions later. Um, I do want to generally agree on the structure and the form and like what this is going to be. So I'm rep So I have something to replicate. So it does take a little bit longer to get going. But uh, yeah, I want to do the revisions later. Can you talk about what's on your plate next? And it, does it have any um, similarity to your to your obstacle ego stillness trilogy? Yeah, I, I have a book that I'm working on now that's a series of biographies of the ancient Stoics, um, like a collection of biographies about all the Stoics. So that's the project I'm working on day to day right now. And then um, actually, while we we're sitting here, my agent uh, called me and uh, has word about a proposal that I sent out. Uh, so I'm, I'm very, uh, very uh, I'm, I'm trying to be present and not think about whether it's good news or bad news. But the the, the other thing that sort of ties into my ritual and routine is that I try to sell the next book before or around the time that one is coming out because I always want to be working, not, not for financial reasons. I just always want to be making forward progress rather than being, you know, I've had books that have worked really well and I've had books that haven't worked as well. And the fact that I always had what I was supposed to do next, I think, prevented either of those things from hitting me too hard. How do you know what's next? Do you, is it is it from your gut? Is it from a sense of what your audience is looking for? Is it market research coming to play at all? How do you how do you know where to focus your energies? It's it starts it's got to start with the gut. It, it, you, I don't know if you choose a book, uh, the, the ideas choose you, but then you decide what direction you're going to take that idea and how you're going to explore it and what 
what way is most conducive to success on the market. Um, but but it's got to be the thing that you, you know, the expression is like, you've got to write the book you can't not write. And so it's got to, it's, there's got to be some, some urge where you're like, I'm just obsessed with this. Just to leave people with, with something, what have you learned and what do you learn from the process of researching and writing these books? Regardless of whether or not they're published, and obviously you've, had, you've been very <laughs> successful in being published, what is the psychic and spiritual and even educational process of making these projects come to fruition? I, I guess maybe to take it in a slightly different direction. I think I'd say the thing I learned from all of these books, again, from some that have worked and some that haven't, is it's and it's a lesson. It's it's in ego, but you have to live it ultimately. So you know, there's a difference between intellectually understanding it and then doing it. It's it's like you control the effort, you don't control the results. Like you control what you put in, you don't control what how it's received. And so ultimately, you know. You have to love the process. You have to love doing it, and you have to know that it's important and that it's meaningful. And the pride, you, you have to have taken out most of what you're going to get from the experience, bef like before launch day. So, like on October one, obviously, if I find out that it sells really starts selling really well, if great reviews come back, if people email to say they love it, that's going to matter to me. It would be insane if if I was totally indifferent to it, but. I would say that I've gotten most of the rewards already. And you and I are talking a week before the book comes out. Like I, I've taken most of my gains off the table. Um, and and I'm, I'm proud of that. It's not easy to do. It's hard to get there. But ultimately, like my satisfaction is that I know that I wrote the best book I was capable of at that time, that I didn't cut corners, that I pushed myself that I improved for the experience and then everything else is extra. This has been Deviate with Rolf Potts. More about everything that was just mentioned, including links to Ryan's new book, Stillness is the Key, can be found in the show notes at rolfpotts.com slash deviate. And as always, you can contact me with insights or questions at deviate at rolfpotts.com. This episode was produced by Justin Glow. Cedar Van Tassel does the theme music. Thanks for listening, and I hope you tune in for future episodes of Deviate with Rolf Potts. Mm -hmm.